Welcome back. Today we're going to talk about chapter 17, which covers respiratory emergencies. Now, the next two chapters, uh, this is respiratory, next one will be uh, cardiology. These are really big chapters to what we do in EMS. And in case you couldn't tell from all the prep work we did, where we were talking a lot about the cardiopulmonary system, this is a huge chunk of the calls that we get. We get a lot of cardiac emergencies and a lot of respiratory emergencies. And these are emergencies that can very easily uh, cause our patients to die in our care if we do not manage them well. So this is where we really get to the meat and potatoes of our job is in the next coming chapters, but especially these next two chapters where we're talking about respiratory and cardiac emergencies. So without further ado, let's hop in. Uh, I will let you know this is a pretty long chapter, but that's because there are a lot of things that we need to know how to diagnose and treat when it comes to respiratory. So we're going to start out with mainly some review of respiration and the physical mechanics behind respiration, as well as some of the anatomy and physiology. So all that should be more or less review from things that we've done in the past. Then we're going to uh, review signs and symptoms of respiratory compromise and breathing difficulty. Then we'll get into the actual specific respiratory emergencies that we'll see, how we diagnose them, the signs and symptoms behind them, and then how we treat them. And then we'll review albuterol and inhalers at the end. So like I said, most of this should be review at this point, but we'll go over it real quickly. Uh, the diaphragm at the bottom of your thorax is a very thin muscle. Uh, it separates our chest from our abdomen. And when we breathe, our abdomen, or sorry, our diaphragm, uh, goes down, which creates negative pressure inside of our chest because our chest is a sealed vault. So we expand that sealed vault and we're going to have negative pressure. That causes air to rush in from the atmosphere and fill up our lungs. And during exhalation, our diaphragm goes up, which then puts positive pressure into our lungs. And then that causes the air to go back out into the atmosphere because air likes the area of least pressure. So that's the actual physical mechanics of how we breathe. Here's just a little picture of where the diaphragm sits in comparison to our lungs and airway. And again, this is our review of how the diaphragm actually works. And it also works in conjunction with our intercostal muscles. Intercostal muscles are the muscles in between our ribs. So our um, intercostal muscles can cause our chest to go out, outward or inward, which will help create that negative pressure space. But most of it is done with the diaphragm. Just remember that uh, expiration, so um, exhaling is technically a passive process. If we relax our body, it's this is what's going to happen. It's going to become a passive movement of air. So something we haven't fully discussed quite yet, so this isn't exactly review right now, is your pleural lining. Your pleural lining covers the inside of your chest wall and the outside of your lungs. So it should have two layers that are in contact with each other, both on the inside and outside. And what it does is it provides lubrication for your lungs to freely move around your chest wall. That way it's not sticking to any part of your chest wall. So there should be some fluid in that area. If that is important for us to know for respiratory emergencies and especially for cardiac emergencies because the pleural lining or pleural area can be a source of pain. So I discussed earlier in the class, not all chest pain is cardiac related. We have to assume it is, but a lot of chest pain can be caused by your pleural lining. So pleural, or pleural pain, we call it pleuritic pain, just to make it a little bit easier to say. So pleuritic pain is pain that is typically sharp. And when we push on it, it usually makes it worse. Or if the person coughs or breathes deep, it usually makes it worse. So those are some big signs that the pain in the chest might not be cardiac related if it's sharp and reproducible is how we say it. 
So if we can push on the area and it hurts a lot to touch, if they cough and it hurts a lot more, if they take a deep breath and it hurts a lot more, those are all big signs that it's probably pleuritic pain. So that's pain in your actual chest wall. That being said, and we'll discuss this more in cardiac emergencies, we can't 100% definitively say that. <clears throat> so we still should be transporting people with chest pain to the hospital because we can't give them the clean bill of health saying that this is definitely not a cardiac emergency. Even ALS providers can't do that. When we have a 12 lead that we can take a look at the heart, we can't catch everything. So any chest pain should be evaluated at the hospital, even if we have strong signs that say it's not cardiac related. But keep that in mind in general that the pleural lining can be the cause of a lot of chest pain that we see in our patients. So moving back into some more review, we need to have a very good sense as to whether a patient is breathing adequately or inadequately. This does come with, a, with experience, so it does make life a little bit easier uh, when you get more and more experience because it'll be easier to pick out who's normal versus who's not normal. And people who are not normal, how bad are they doing really? It's, it's a lot easier to know someone's not breathing adequately when you've seen a couple hundred people that aren't breathing adequately and they look exactly like those couple hundred people. A lot easier to pick out than if you've never seen someone who has inadequate breathing before. So again, this comes with time and experience, but it is important that we know the textbook signs and symptoms of adequate breathing versus inadequate breathing. So adequate breathing, again, is breathing that is sufficient to perfuse our bodies. We shouldn't see anyone with saying that they have distress. So they shouldn't say I'm short of breath or I feel like it's hard to breathe. Look to see if they can speak in full sentences. Uh, there's some people that have difficulty breathing that they can only breathe or speak one or two words um, before they have to breathe again. And that's a strong sign that they're having some respiratory distress. We'll talk about that a little, a little bit later from now. And then also assess our basic vital signs. Yeah, assess their skin color, their temperature, their condition. Usually people who are having poor perfusion due to respiratory distress will have poor skin color, poor skin temperature, poor skin condition. And then assess their mentation. Remember, our brains take an incredible amount of oxygen to function normally. And if they sense that's not getting enough oxygen, it's going to start shutting down the functions that are not essential to keep you alive. One of those first functions is your consciousness. So if you're not breathing adequately, you're going to have altered mentation because your brain is prioritizing the brain stem and places that keep your body actually functioning over the areas of the brain that make it so that we're alert and oriented. Remember when we're looking at actual vital signs, we need to look at the rate, rhythm, and quality. So just a quick review of our normal rates. In adults, you're looking for 12 to 20 is your normal respiratory rate. For kids, usually about five to 10, you're looking at uh, 15 to 30 breaths per minute for a kid. And remember, as they get older, that rate comes down progressively. So a 10 year old, you're looking more towards the 15 to 20 area versus a five year old, but you're looking more at the 20, 25, 30 area. And then a infant, we're looking in between 25 to 50 breaths per minute. Infants, since they have very small lungs and they have high oxygen demand because they're growing exponentially, so your cells need a lot more ATP, they're going to be breathing a whole lot faster. As far as rhythm, you want a nice consistent rhythm. It should march out very, very consistently. It shouldn't be very fast for a few seconds, then nothing for a few more seconds. It should be nice and even. And then quality, look to see how well they're taking that air in. Do they look like they're distressed? Does it look like they're barely moving any air? Does it look like they're really struggling to move that air in and out? So look at the quality. And then also remember to assess breath sounds. That will actually tell you if air is moving in and out of the lungs. You should be able to hear that process happening. And then inadequate breathing. Remember, it's breathing that we do not get adequate perfusion from, so we cannot support life from it. 
So we're looking for if our rate is either really slow or really fast sometimes. You're looking to see if the rhythm is regular. Uh, you're again looking for lung sounds to make sure that lung air is actually moving in and out. And if it's not, it's not adequate breathing. And you're looking to see if they're taking a full breath. So that's tidal line. If they're taking very, very short, shallow respirations, that's usually not adequate. And that's usually a big indication that something's going on that we need to fix to make the breathing more adequate. So once again, this comes with experience, but learn all the signs and symptoms that the textbook tells you. And that way, when you see it, it'll be a lot more easy to uh, pick out of the crowd, especially when you're new. You have to know these textbook things to look for. And then once you get a lot more experience, it will come very naturally to you. You can see someone from 10 feet away and know within a second are, if they're breathing adequately or not. Moving on to pediatrics. Again, this should be nothing new for you guys at this point. Uh, the structure of pediatric airways are different than those of an adult. A pediatric airway, if you think of a funnel, they start big and then they get really narrow. And because they get narrow further down the airway, uh, they become very easily obstructed. Also, proportionately, a, a pediatric tongue is much larger than adult, so it takes up a bigger area of your airway, which means it becomes an obstruction a whole lot quicker. Their tracheas are smaller and they're more flexible. They don't have the good cartilage developed yet. And they rely very heavily on their diaphragm for breathing in and out because they don't have good development of their intercostal muscles yet. If you think of a four-year-old's chest versus a 28-year-old's chest, the 28-year-old will have a whole lot more muscles in their chest than the four-year-old does. So the intercostal muscles will help an adult a whole lot more than they'll help a kid out. So when we're looking at how well a um, pediatric patient is breathing, we do have some signs that we see a lot more in kids than we do in adults. We did cover all this in airway management, but again, we'll review it. Uh, nasal flaring, that's where the outside of the nose gets a lot bigger to try to open up the airway a little bit more, get more air to um, go in. Kids will grunt a little bit more, especially if they can't talk. You'll just notice a small grunting sound when they breathe. Uh, seesaw breathing, that's where if you look at their abdomen and their chest, it looks like a seesaw going back and forth. So their abdomen will get really big, their chest will get really small, and then go the other way, their abdomen will get small, their chest will get big, and you'll see that going back and forth. That means that they're really struggling to try to bring that air in because their diaphragm is working over time. And then chest retractions, that's if you look at the ribs, and um, especially if you look up towards the clavicles, you'll see that the skin will sink in when they take a breath in, and that means that there's too much negative pressure inside your chest, which means not enough air is getting inside the chest when the diaphragm goes down. So it sucks all that skin in because there's a big negative pressure space in there that the lungs are not pushing against when they inflate like they should when they're normal. So general patient care, when we have inadequate breathing, we want to assist ventilation. Uh, and we also include supplemental oxygen with that. So if they are truly not breathing adequately at all, they cannot on their own perfuse well enough, we are moving to the actual BVM with oxygen or CPAP. Remember CPAP stands for continuous positive airway pressure. And that's a big mask that every time that the patient breathes on their own, it's going to force air into their lungs. And it also keeps a continuous flow to try to keep their airway open more. So CPAP is a great option for our conscious patients because it is very hard to effectively ventilate a conscious patient with a bag valve mask. So it does help a lot of conscious people and keep them from deteriorating even further. So for people who are truly not breathing adequately enough to perfuse themselves, this is the care that we have to do at the start. And again, this comes with experience of seeing people who are breathing adequately versus inadequately. Then some review with uh, giving actual BVM ventilations. 
we're giving just enough to see chest rise and then we're allowing enough time for chest fall to happen. So we're looking for chest rise and chest fall with every single breath that we get when we're battling someone. As far as rate, we want to give one breath every five to six seconds for an adult, which equals about 10 to 12 breaths per minute. We want to be kind of under ventilating what the body normally does. And that's just be because we give a lot more force behind our ventilations than a normal body takes when we breathe in. So we need to give that extra time for the body to get all the air and then to release all that air. So we need to have a extended expiratory phase. When we're ventilating a kid, we're looking at about 20 breaths per minute, and that equals about one breath every three seconds. So adults, one breath every six seconds, kids, one breath every three seconds. So when we are artificially ventilating an adult, you should be taking a very close look at the heart rate. If the heart rate is going up, that means the body is compensating still. So that means you're probably not giving adequate ventilations uh, on the patient if you see the heart rate going up because the body is still sensing that there's poor perfusion. We need to move that blood around faster. So the answer to that is jacking the heart rate up. So in adults, a high heart rate means you're probably not ventilating well enough. In a pediatric patient, the opposite is true. Pediatric patients, and we'll discuss this a lot more in pediatric emergencies, but pediatric patients tend to maintain at their baseline for a very long time and then they just suddenly crash. So their body can't compensate nearly as well as adults do. We aren't gonna be seeing these drastic vital sign changes to indicate that the patient is in a large amount of distress like we do in adults. That's why we'll talk about this in the whole pediatric day. <clears throat> so when a pediatric patient is not being ventilated well enough and they have poor perfusion, their heart rate's actually going to start going down because they don't know how to compensate for that as well yet. So if you see the heart rate going down in a pediatric patient, that should be very alarming that they are not getting enough ventilation. So that's a sign that they that you're not doing your job well enough of ventilating the patient is the heart rate actually going down. So adults, going up means that you're not doing well enough. Kids, going down means you're not doing well enough. These are just some extra signs to help you. You know, Use all your tools in your toolbox to determine if you're getting good ventilations. There could be other reasons why the heart rate is going up or down in an adult or a kid, but this is just one common reason why, and you can use it so that if you see an adult, the heart rate went from 100 to 150, take a second look at all your other metrics to find out if you're ventilating well enough. You know, it could be something else is happening and then you're ventilating just fine, but it should be a sign to take a double and triple check as to how well ventilation is happening. All right, moving on into some breathing difficulty. So breathing difficulty is a subjective measure. If you remember subjective from communication documentation, we talked about subjective versus objective. Subjective is what the patient tells you. So it's not something that we can physically measure on a patient. We cannot say this patient has X amount of shortness of breath. That's something that a patient has to actually tell us. So it should follow up with signs that we can objectively see. So objective is things we can measure. So a patient who says that they're having a really hard time breathing, that's their subjective perception, but we should see some shallow respirations that are going really fast and there could be minimal uh, lung sounds, so we know that not much air is moving. Those are our objective measures that confirm the patient's subjective perception. Now, the problem with diff breathing difficulty being a subjective perception is not every person's subjective perception of it is the same. There can be some people that say, oh, I'm having the worst time breathing. I feel like I'm going to die and they look absolutely fine. They're standing up, they're talking to you in full sentences, they're breathing 12 times a minute, they have clear lung sounds, you see that the 
the breathing is going in and out just fine, everything's regular, and they're telling you that they're having the worst time breathing ever. That happens quite a bit. <laughs> so you have to rely on your assessment abilities to verify the person's level of respiratory distress. There are also some people that say, oh, I, I feel okay, but you see all the signs that tell you that they're having a hard time breathing. So take, take what the patient says into account, and that does guide a lot of our treatments is their subjective perception of difficulty breathing, but also rely on your ability to actually assess the patient. Now, if you have someone who says that they're having the worst time breathing in their life and all your assessments say that everything's normal, that might be a cue for you to do a much more focused assessment and use all your tools at your disposal. For example, someone, and we'll talk about this a little bit later in this chapter, someone who has a pulmonary embolism might not show the typical signs of breathing difficulty that we're used to seeing in someone that has, for example, an asthma attack but then you put the SpO2 monitor on them and you have a good waveform and so you know it's relatively accurate and they're reading at 75 percent which is a very very low percentage of oxygen saturation as you remember from vital signs so that will tell you that they really actually are having difficulty breathing it's just from a different mechanism than we're used to seeing and again we'll talk about this a lot more later on in this chapter so use both your assessment ability and their subjective perception to breathing difficulty, but also know that just because they're saying they're having difficulty breathing doesn't mean that they necessarily are having a large amount of distress. So take everything in the greater picture of patient care. I've said that to you guys dozens of times already. I'm going to say it to you dozens of times more throughout this class. You have to look at everything in the grand scheme of the overall patient. So let's take a quick look at this guy right here. What can you objectively see that's telling you if this guy is breathing adequately or not? So if you look right here is a classic tripod position. So his hands are on his knees and he's leaning forward. So that is your classic tripod position and we know tripod is a big sign of difficulty breathing. Also take a look at his face. Does he look like he's comfortable or does he look like he's in distress? You know, it looks like he's having a, a hard time breathing. If you look, you can see that his chest is a little thicker than it probably should be. We'll talk about that in a couple slides from now. That's a sign of possible him having barrel chest. And again, we'll talk about that in a couple slides. So this patient is having a hard time breathing from our objective assessment. So if you remember our patient assessment, we talked about OPQRSTI. So the, your OPQRSTI is how we can do a focused assessment on what's bothering you. Typically, th these questions work a lot better for pain. They're designed to assess pain a little bit better. So we have to adapt them a little bit to breathing difficulty, but we can still ask all these questions and it's going to provide valuable insight to find out what's going on with this patient in your focus assessment. So for breathing difficulty, for onset, it's relatively the same. We say, what were you doing when this began? Provocation. Does anything make this better or worse? Big um, thing that might make breathing worse is when you stand up and walk around, does this make the breathing worse? That would be shortness of breath on exertion of your body. That's a big key assessment tool is, does this get worse with exertion? Quality, um, we can usually ask, do they have a cough? And if they do have a cough, is it productive? Productive means, are you bringing like phlegm up with this cough? So that would be a productive cough. So radiation is one that I personally don't think matches our assessment very well for respiratory distress. But for radiation, you can ask, does this cause anything else going on in your body? You know, are you having chest pain because of this difficulty breathing? Are you having pain anywhere else because of this difficulty breathing? Does anything feel uncomfortable because of this difficulty breathing? So again, this is one that personally I think is 
a little bit more geared towards pain and isn't the best measurement for respiratory stress, but these are some questions you can ask to get radiation checked off for your OBQRS TI. Next, you have S for severity. So you'd say on a scale of one to 10, how bad is your uh, breathing trouble? Uh, typically, I will ask them, especially if they have a history of respiratory distress. So if they have like a history of asthma, I, I'll say, how does this compare to your previous episodes? You know, it does, is this better than what you usually feel? Is this about the same or is this a lot worse than what you usually have? Because that will give us a good gauge as to how this patient is doing personally. Uh, one thing that we can expand on is if a patient says, oh, this is, this feels like the time that I went to the hospital last, then you know that this is a pretty bad episode. Or if they say this is the time that I stopped breathing, that felt like the time I stopped breathing and I was in the hospital for two months, then that could be a very alarming that the patient could go downhill very, very fast and you have to be prepared for that. So severity is a very important question. Uh, that we should be asking for respiratory distress. Then time, exactly as we usually ask it, how long has this been going on for? A lot of people confuse onset and time. Onset is geared more towards what they were doing. Time is when they were doing it. So if someone got difficulty breathing as they were outside mowing their yard, you can say onset was they were mowing their yard. Time was they were mowing their yard 30 minutes ago, and it's been continuing ever since then. And then interventions, that's a huge one to ask for breathing difficulty, especially if they have a history of it and they are prescribed medications to help them on it. So if they're an asthmatic and they have an inhaler, ask, have you used your inhaler? Have you done anything else to help this difficulty breathing out? So again, when we're seeing general difficulty breathing, you want to be looking at your patient. You should be able to see, do they have altered mentation, which indicates that they have poor perfusion. You also want to be seeing, are they tripoding? Do they look like from a distance that they're having a hard time breathing? Also, uh, we can look at different anatomy in the patient. One thing that we look for is called barrel chest, which we're going to see in the next slide. So a barrel chest is a result of overexertion of your chest muscles for a very long period of time. So if someone who has a long chronic history of respiratory stress and they have, they've been struggling to breathe every day for years, they're going to have increased muscles around your chest because your uh, secondary muscles that help you breathe are working overtime for a very long period of time because your diaphragm alone is not doing the job. So you're going to see this buildup right back here and of muscles because you have a lot more use of them versus a normal person doesn't have that buildup of muscles. So if you see a very large uh, chest, especially in the back, then that might be a sign that someone's had a very long history of respiratory distress. And that's something that we can use in part of our assessments to know if this is something that we should be concerned a lot more for difficulty breathing. On. We're also looking for their work of breathing. So again, this should be some somewhat review, but we're looking for retractions, use of accessory muscles uh, around your chest, your um, nasal flaring, pursed lips. And that's, uh, that's something that the patient kind of push their lips out to help them push um, air out further. That's a sign that air is getting trapped in your lungs. And also look at how many words they can say without stopping. If they have to take a breath after every single word, so they sound like, I'm having trouble breathing, that's a lot more concerning than someone who just says to you, oh, I'm having a hard time breathing. So that's a huge key sign that we look for to determine how well they're breathing. Take a look at their skin. Uh, also look at their feet. So pedal edema. So that's edema at their feet. And as we know, edema means swelling or fluid buildup. 
So that's a sign that they might have something called congestive heart failure, which we'll talk about a little bit today, and we'll talk about a lot more in chapter 18 for cardiac emergencies. So stand by for why pedal edema matters. Also look at their chest movement. We know that a normal chest should be um, rising and falling. If they are not doing that with good depth, either one way or the other, that's a alarming sign for us. And then, again, check your oxygen saturation. We talk about this a lot in vital signs. If the reading is less than 92%, then that's a sign that they are hypoxic. Again, uh, if you want to listen to me rant and rape about oxygen saturation readings, you can go back and watch the vital signs presentation. But just know that it is a very valuable tool. It's not the end-all, be-all. So take everything in the context of greater patient care. So taking a look at this patient right here. Real quickly, do you think that they're having a hard time breathing? So this guy, to me, appears that he's having a hard time breathing. So let's take a look at some things that we might be seeing. We see hands on the knees and leaning forward a little bit. So his back is leaning forward. That is the tripod position. So right there is a telltale sign that someone might be having a hard time breathing. Look at his chest. His chest has retractions. His skin is sucked up against his ribs. And if you got a better angle here, I'm sure that you'll see his skin being sucked down against his clavicles. You can see his face. He looks relatively uncomfortable. You can see he's already on oxygen. Uh, some things that we'd be wanting to assess is his skin color. So look at his lips to see if you see any skin color. Look at his fingernail beds to see if it's a normal pink color or if it's turning a little blue. Uh, if you look down at his abdomen, it looks like his abdomen muscles are being used a little bit. So that would be another sign of accessory muscle use. I would want to see if this guy is able to talk to me normally, if he's taking breaths between uh, words, if he is oriented or not. So these are all some things that we are looking for very quickly to see if the patient is in respiratory distress or not. This patient looks like he's in a decent amount of respiratory distress. <clears throat> Another huge thing that we need to be assessing are lung sounds. Um, so we are looking for uh, our typical sounds that we already covered in uh, vital signs. So we're looking for their normal lung sounds, if they are wheezing, if they are if they're strider, if they're coughing a lot, if they have snoring respirations, uh, if they have gurgling respirations. And also uh, something that we can really help to gauge if they're having a hard time or not is uh, for wheezes. They're audible. Audible wheezes is something that you can hear from a, a distance. You know, I can be standing three feet away from you. I can hear that you're wheezing. That is audible wheezing. You don't need a stethoscope to actually listen to it. And that's usually a sign that the patient's having a very hard time breathing. Also, um, we can oscillate our lung sounds. So that's actually putting a stethoscope to the patient and listening to them, you want to listen to both inspiration and expiration to get the full picture of the lung sounds. You also don't want to just listen in one spot per lung. I personally listen to eight spots. You sh I believe you should be listening to the top and the bottom on the front and the back of each lung. So that would be four spots on each lung. So top and bottom on the right and left side of the anterior side of the patient and then top and bottom on the right and left side of the posterior side of the patient. So that's eight spots gives you a good good view of the entire lung. So again, lung sounds that we're listening to for. I said this before, I'll say it again. When you're first starting out, I want you to be listening to every single patient's lung sounds. Even if they don't have a respiratory complaint, you should be listening to your lung sounds anyway. And that way you get to master what is normal. And then when it's not normal, it's going to stick out to you like a sore thumb. I eventually want you guys to be able to tell me what exact lung sounds are. But this only comes with time. 
You have to be able to listen to enough wheezes to know that this is wheezing versus strider. Or you have to listen to enough um, crackles, which we call rails, to know that that's not Ronkai. So it will come with time. The biggest thing is you need to master what normal versus not normal is at the start. And then we'll move on to more specifics. So all that being said, uh, wheezes. Wheezes we're going to see in bronchoconstriction typically. So that's when your bronchioles are constricting and we don't have a big enough passage to move air through. So we're still forcing air through there, but it's at a much smaller area, which means it's going to kind of wheeze as it comes through. This is very typical in asthmatic patients or COPD patients. So wheezes are probably one of the most common, not normal lung sounds we hear. Then crackles or rails is a better term for this. Uh, rails is the sound that you hear when air is passing through water. So that indicates that there is fluid in your lungs. So it's a bubbling or crackling sound that's usually heard at the bases of your lungs because fluid follows gravity. And so it's going to be collecting at the point closest to the ground, which in a patient who's sitting up will be your basis. That's why you have to listen to the tops and the bottoms of your lungs because if you just listen to the tops, you might miss the crackles happening in the bases. So crackles or rails indicates fluid in the lungs. Mm -hmm. Then there's ronchi. <laughs> ronchi is the sound of air trying to pass through phlegm. We see ronchi in our, our patients have pneumonia a lot. So it's a lower pitch sound that's kind of a rattle and it's the sound of air trying to get through thick phlegm so it's kind of similar to rails or the crackles because the air is trying to get through a substance it's just rails is fluid ronchi is phlegm so there is a slight difference between the two but it's pretty hard to master at the start so this is why you really have to be listening to a lot of different lung sounds then strider, that's the sound of uh, air trying to get through a very small opening, typically in your upper airway. Strider is something that we see with airway obstructions, especially in people who are having allergic reactions. So it's a very high pitched sound coming from your upper airway. And it usually means that there's a partial obstruction somewhere in your larynx or trachea. That's why in patients that we are suspecting have uh, a anaphylactic reaction or allergic reaction we should be listening to throat sounds as well because that is exactly where the source of strider comes from is near your throat so we want to be listening for the actual source of that sound just to be sure that we don't have any strider happening All right, and then we want to be checking our vital signs uh, we want to be looking for our heart rate a lot of adult patients, if they're having a hard time breathing, their heart rate goes up because you're compensating for that lack of perfusion. You want to be looking at your breathing rate and rhythm as well as quality. And then check out hypo, hypo or hypertension. All that being said, not everyone's body compensates the same way with difficulty breathing. So just because a patient doesn't have tachycardia doesn't mean that their body isn't having difficulty breathing happening. So these are some things that can help support your argument, but they're not the end all be all. So not the most important, especially like blood pressure um, and heart rate. They aren't the most important things to assess. They're something we want to take an eye or a look at, but they aren't the most critical. This is the end all be all of your having difficulty breathing or not. So keep that in the back of your head that this can help especially if you're really having a hard time deciding if they're having a hard time breathing or not, take a look at their vital signs, which might give you a little bit more insight into this. So moving into general respiratory patient care, this kind of goes hand in hand with airway management. So this should be somewhat review for you guys. And then we're going to be hopping into very specific things of what we're doing for our patients. So 
general patient care, we start off with making sure that they're breathing adequately. If they're not breathing adequately, you should be giving artificial ventilations. If it is adequate, but they're having difficulty breathing, we want to be giving them supplemental oxygen. So use a non-rebreather mask at 15 liters per minute, and then use a nasal cannula if indicated. So our indications for a nasal cannula are a patient cannot tolerate having the non-rebreather mask on them, or they are actively vomiting. So we don't want vomit to be coming up into that mask and then being pushed back down their airway. So that is the textbook definition. In New York State, uh, we have moved more towards a not so aggressive approach for difficulty breathing. So our oxygen administration is more geared towards your SpO2 readings. So if the patient has an SpO2 below 92%, that's where we should be giving uh, uh, supplemental oxygen. Again, make sure that your reading is accurate. And then when we're giving supplemental oxygen, our goal is to be at or above 92%. So if you are on a non-rebreather at 15 liters per minute and you're at 100%, you can start to back that oxygen administration down. So say you change it to 10 liters per minute and they still stay at at 100%, then you can consider going to a nasal cannula at 6 liters per minute, they're still at 100%, back that down, and keep on backing down until their SpO2 falls within an unacceptable range, which would be below 92%. So that's the new guidelines that uh, us as EMTs in New York State are following. But if the patient is having severe respiratory distress, but their SpO2 is reading 100%, don't withhold oxygen from them just because of that. Because as we know, SpO2 readings will measure the amount of molecules attached to hemoglobin, and that's not always oxygen molecules. So take a good look at your patient as well as your SpO2 readings. If those two don't line up, then think that your SpO2 might not be accurate. Most of the time, those two things should line up. Your assessment saying that the patient's having respiratory distress should line up with your SpO2 reading being low. Or your assessment saying the patient is not in respiratory distress should line up with your SpO2 reading in a normal range. It is relatively rare that those two things are mismatched. It's very rare that I'm surprised by my SpO2 reading. I would say probably one in 200 patients I am surprised by the SpO2 reading. I should already know before I even put that monitor on them what their SpO2 range should be. So a big part of your general patient care for difficulty breathing patients is position them properly. So it says place a patient in position of comfort, but also place them in a position of function. There's a reason that people who are having difficulty breathing sit in a tripod position. They want to sit up. They don't want to be laying, laying back because that puts all their weight of their chest on their uh, lungs, which then you have to fight against to breathe well. So patients sitting straight up is typically a good position for someone to be in when they're having respiratory stress because that takes a lot of the weight off of their chest, which means you aren't fighting against it anymore. So proper positioning is huge in general respiratory care. That's the first thing that you should do, ALS or BLS, is position the patient properly. That drives me wild when we have a difficulty breathing patient, we bring them to the stretcher, and the stretcher is only raised halfway in a semi-fowler's position, and the patient lays down and their difficulty breathing gets worse. Well, that's because they're not positioned properly. So sit that stretcher all the way up uh, at a 90 degree angle, sometimes put uh, pillows behind the patient to even sit them up beyond a 90 degree angle, and that should help them with their difficulty breathing significantly. Uh, more general care is you can help them with their own medications, or we can give our own medications, and we'll talk about that a lot more a little bit later, is what type of medications are we using? Typically, we want to be using our own medications. So we position them properly. We give the medications that we're indicated to give. And then if needed, we can give continuous positive air repressure or CPAP. That is if they are having a very hard time 
So reviewing CPAP, remember CPAP, we're giving the uh, airway a lot more pressure than it usually has. We're forcing that air into our airway. And forcing the air into the airway uh, prevents our alveoli from collapsing, which uh, so it keeps them open, which allows for better gas exchange to happen. And also putting that extra pressure into the airway will prevent fluid going from the uh, blood bloodstream and the capillaries uh, going from there into your alveoli. We're going to talk about that a little bit more later. So we use this for general respiratory failure patients, but we will think about this a lot sooner in patients that have asthma and COPD and also patients who have pulmonary edema. Pulmonary edema is fluid in the airway. So if you break those words down, pulmonary is lungs, and edema is fluid. So that's where we have fluid going from our bloodstream into our lungs, a place that we don't want it to be in. So CPAP actually helps quite a bit with that. And CPAP helps with asthma and COPD because we have constricted airways. And so having that extra force behind the air coming in will help it push through those constricted airways, especially to get the medications that we're trying to give to open those airways up um, into the actual airway. This will help force that stuff into the airway. Contraindications for CPAP, uh, they have to be able to follow your commands. So they have to be able to know what's going on and be able to respond to your commands. Uh, they need to be able to breathe themselves. CPAP works a lot better when you're actually taking spontaneous respirations because then the air gets in while you're breathing. So if they are not breathing by themselves, we have to go to a VVM instead. Active vomiting is another contraindication because again, we don't want that vomit to come up and then be shoved down into their airway and we aspirate. Uh, profound hypotension. CPAP, since it puts so much pressure inside of your chest, that pressure can push on the heart because your heart is in your chest. So if you're pushing on your heart, your heart might not be able to refill and contract nearly as well because it's being compressed. So if we already have hypotension, which means our blood, our heart's not pumping out blood hard enough, if we compress that heart that's already struggling, we can cause even more hypotension, which can cause even more uh, hypoperfusion and put them into decompensated shock very fast. So if you see a big hypotension, hypotensive patient, then probably not do CPAP, and I think that we're going to be doing VVM ventilations a little bit later. An ability to obtain a good mask seal. CPAP only works if you have a good mask seal, so if you have some reason why you can't get that mask seal, it's not going to be effective, so we won't be doing that treatment since it won't be effective. And then complete an ability to tolerate the treatment. And there are some patients who just cannot tolerate having the mask strapped to their face. This is where we really have to try to talk to our patients and therapeutically communicate with them and let them know why we're doing what we're doing, how it's going to feel, and what, and how it's going to make them better. But there are some patients that just absolutely refuse to listen to us and they will rip the mask off every single time. So if you can't physically get the mask on them, then try to do another source of treatment try to at least get the non-rebreather mask on them or something else to get oxygen into their body. Some side effects that we look at in CPAP, hypotension is one because again, we're compressing the heart a little bit with all that extra pressure inside the chest. You have increased risk of aspiration, like we talked about with active vomiting, it can go right back down into your airway. Drying of corneas, so that's drying up your eyes. That's just because all the air that is being thrown at your face, if there's any leak in your mask seal, it can go into your eyes and will be a little bit uncomfortable. And the last one is pneumothorax, which we're going to be discussing pneumothorax a little bit later in the chapter. But pneumothorax is a life-threatening condition that can happen, and we'll, again, revisit this a little bit later in the chapter. Remember when we are doing CPAP, explain the procedure to the patient and you start at the lowest levels of therapy and then you can go higher and higher. 
the minimal setting that we start at is five centimeters of water. The maximum we go to is 15. So different devices have different ways of measuring this pressure. So be very familiar with your agency specific uh, CPAP and how you deliver these oxygen levels or this pressure level, sorry. Most of them are related to how much oxygen you're giving. So remember our minimal setting though is five centimeters of water and we max out at, um, sorry, I said 15 earlier, I apologize. We max out at 10 centimeters of water. So five, our next setting is usually 7.5 and then our max setting is 10. So I do apologize for the slide, I did say 15, it is 10. When we're doing CPAP, make sure that you reassess the patient's mental status and vital signs and level of difficulty breathing frequently. If they are going downhill, we probably are going to have to be moving to using BVM ventilations. If they aren't getting any better or if they are going downhill um, slowly, then you can increase your CPAP pressure. So you go from that 5 to 7.5, you can go from 7.5 to 10 in terms of pressure. So reassess them very frequently, be prepared to move to BVM ventilations or increase the CPAP level. And if they deteriorate fast enough, remove the CPAP and begin ventilating with a BVM. All right, so now that we've covered all of that information, which Again, most of it should have been review. We're now going to move into the specific respiratory conditions that we see and how to treat them. So this is moving into the actual signs and symptoms and treatments of patients. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. We abbreviate that as COPD. You've heard me mention COPD quite a few times already. So breaking down that word or those words, chronic we know means repetitive. So we have acute or chronic. So this is a repetitive process. Then obstructive means that it obstructs the airway somehow. Then pulmonary is lungs and then disease. So this is a disease that will repetitively obstruct your lungs. Typically, this is done by bronchoconstriction. So, all that being said, COPD is not a disease in itself. It is a classification of diseases. So, a disease can be a COP disease. COPD in itself is not a disease, if that makes sense. Uh, the most common ones that we see are emphysema and chronic bronchitis. The most common one I personally see is usually chronic bronchitis. Uh, one key thing to remember is COPD does not include asthma. Asthma is an obstructive pulmonary disease, but it is not considered acute. Or Sorry, it's not considered chronic. It's considered acute. So you have acute ex exacerbations of asthma, not chronic. So... Our treatment of asthma is relatively the same, but do you remember asthma is not a form of COPD. The big ones that we are looking at are emphysema and chronic bronchitis. Black lung is listed in there. Black lung is a pretty rare thing to see nowadays, but it is a form of COPD. Most COPD patients have a history of smoking either currently or in the past. That is a huge cause of COPD. So patients who have a smoking history, make sure to ask them, do you have any diagnosed breathing problems? Do you have asthma, emphysema, chronic bronchitis, anything like that? Or say, do you have COPD? Because a lot of patients will say, oh, I have COPD, and they won't know the specific. So they'll think that COPD is a disease in itself. But as we know, it's a broad classification of diseases. But if you say COPD, the patient will probably say, oh, yeah, I have COPD. So first one we'll talk about is chronic bronchitis. Again, very common form of COPD that we see. So 
bronchitis, if you look at that word, itis at the end means inflammation, and we have bronch. So the bronchioles are inflamed. The lining specifically of the bronchioles are inflamed. In addition to being inflamed, we're going to have a lot more mucus produced. Air cannot travel well through mucus. So having an inflamed area that is full of mucus is darn near impossible to move air through, which means we can't get it to the alveoli where the gas exchange actually happens. And also, once it's in the alveoli, it's hard for the air to get out because it has to go through all that mucus and inflammation. So we end up trapping air that is rich in carbon dioxide because after the gas exchange happens, it can't get out of our lungs. Now, mucus in the lungs is normal. We're supposed to have some mucus in the lungs because it traps diseases that we breathe in. It traps things that shouldn't be in our body. So mucus is supposed to be there, and then when it traps things, it gets removed. Uh, during bronchitis, the cells that normally clear away the mucus accumulations can't. So we have a lot of mucus being produced, and we don't have a way to get rid of it as well. So we have a triad of bad things happening. We have inflammation, we have excess mucus production, and we have an ability to move that mucus away. So chronic bronchitis is a could, can be a deadly thing that happens. This is why a lot of chronic bronchitis patients are coughing a lot, and they're bringing some phlegm up when they cough, because that is your secondary way to remove phlegm, is really hard force all that pressure into your from your lungs and try to bring it out in a cough. So you might see phlegm coming up with a chronic bronchitis patient. <clears throat> Next COPD disease that we'll talk about is emphysema. So in emphysema, our actual alveoli start to break down. Uh, so you aren't able to exchange gas there any, anymore because the alveoli themselves are breaking down. If we have less alveoli, then we have less ability to exchange air, which uh, emphysema is a long-term problem because over time you start to lose more and more and more alveoli, which means the surface area for respiratory exchange gets less and less and less and less. Your lungs, since your alveoli are breaking down, they also lose elasticity so they are not able to inflate and deflate nearly as well anymore, which causes a lot more problems. It means that our diaphragm has to work overtime, and then it triggers our accessory muscles to work overtime. And these are patients that we see with emphysema, are patients that look like they are very, very thin and can be skin and bone. And that's because your body is working double, triple, quadruple the amount of effort to actually breathe. So you're burning so many calories to breathe because you have to use all your accessory muscles to breathe or move your lungs every single time. And you're still not getting enough air to exchange because uh, your alveoli are breaking down. So these those patients that look like they're skin and bone when they're 60, 70 years old are oftentimes emphysema patients. These are very tiny people because they're burning all of their energy in trying to breathe. You also have, um, just like in bronchitis, uh, you have air that has carbon dioxide that gets trapped inside the lungs because we can't squeeze the lungs to push it out as well, which when we have carbon dioxide in the lungs, we can't have oxygen in the same place, and so it reduces our effectiveness of breathing. Emphysema is a nasty, nasty disease that just keeps on getting worse as more time goes on. So these are some pictures of uh, alveoli. So over on this side, we have a normal alveoli. And take a look at your walls right here. So that's normal. When we have bronchitis, we have inflammation happening in your alveoli. We also have inflammation happening in your bronchioles. And we also have mucus that will plug this area up. If we have inflammation and mucus that seals 
these holes, so these holes are sealed or reduced significantly, then we have a combination of air can't get in and air can't get out. So we have an increase of carbon dioxide in this level because it can't get out. And we also have a decrease in oxygen being able to get in. And then we move over to emphysema and these walls start to break down completely. So these are missing, which means that you only have this area instead of the full circle of area of gas exchange happening. So this reduces significantly the amount of gas exchange that, that can happen in your alveoli. So moving on into asthma. So like I said, asthma and COPD is largely treated the same way. So asthma is a chronic disease that people have, but it has acute exacerbations versus chronic bronchitis is you will have a long-term exacerbation of bronchitis. It just can get worse at certain times, but bronchitis is something that's going to be continually happening in your body versus asthma. You will have asthma as a disease, but you will be normal and then not normal. So you have an acute exacerbation of it. So that's why asthma is not a form of COPD. So asthma, when you have the exacerbation, your bronchioles will constrict and mucus is overproduced. Does it sound a little bit familiar? <laughs> uh, asthma and bronchitis have very similar disease pathways or pathophysiology, if you remember that term. So you're going to have very similar issues and that's why we treat it very, very similarly. Uh, when we have asthma, the bronchioles, especially the smaller bronchioles, will get very, very, very constricted, which constricts your airflow in and out. So typically in asthma, you can either breathe in okay, or you can breathe out okay. So airflow is mainly restricted in one direction or the other. So either air can come in decently, but then it gets trapped and can't get out, or air can get out decently, but it can't get in. So asthma can either be inspiratory or expiratory, and that's why we listen to lung sounds both um, for inhalation and exhalation, and you might hear wheezes uh, in the inspiratory phase or in the expiratory phase, or sometimes you might hear it both. So we refer to that as inspiratory, expiratory wheezing versus expiratory wheezes or inspiratory wheezes. But typically, airflow is restricted in one direction. So you can get in, but not out, or you can get out, but not in. So as far as our treatments for asthma and COPD, as I've said before, we treat them relatively the same way. So you want to be assessing your breathing status and lung sounds. The main lung sound we hear with COPD or asthma is wheezes. So wheezes is a strong indication that they're having asthma or COPD going on. Uh, so our main treatments, we give supplemental oxygen, and then we give albuterol. So remember our albuterol dose is 2.5 milligrams of albuterol given via a nebulizer. And that nebulizer we have to set at a rate of 6 to 8 liters per minute of oxygen. So that is the medication that we're giving for COPD, COPD, or asthma. We can repeat our albuterol dose three times before we have to call for medical control order for further treatment. So uh, if you have any questions about albuterol, refer back to our general pharmacology presentation. You can also consider CPAP or a form of positive pressure, which is bag valve mask. Sometimes we need to use that to get the albuterol into the patient because if the patient is so constricted that we can't get the air in normally by them breathing, then we use CPAP and we can force the albuterol in that way with the pressure that we're exerting with the CPAP. You can also consider calling for a medical control order for epinephrine. So that would be an adult 0.3 milligrams and a child 0.15 milligrams of epinephrine. Again, that is only, only, only with a medical control order. 
So you have to get a doctor to say, yes, you can do this. You cannot do this on your own. This is a last line thing that we do. Me personally, in the past 10 years of being a paramedic, I've never given epinephrine for a asthma or COPD exacerbation. I have many other drugs that I can use to stabilize the patient. So this is a last ditch effort of nothing else is working. You can call and ask if you can give epinephrine. So moving on into pulmonary edema. As I said a little bit earlier, pulmonary edema is fluid in the lungs. So that's a very dangerous thing to have happen because oxygen can't really exchange and um, gas exchange can't happen if you have fluid blocking that area. So the overwhelming majority of patients that have pulmonary edema have a history of congestive heart failure which is abbreviated CHF. So CHF will cover a lot more in cardiac emergencies, but I do want to touch on that today because this does explain pulmonary edema pretty well. So if, if your heart can't effectively pump well enough, specifically your left ventricle, if your left ventricle is not pumping well enough, you can't get the blood out well enough, you're going to have a backup in your system. So if you think about your cardiac anatomy, if your left ventricle can't move blood, left ventricle gets blood from your right atrium, or sorry, your left ventricle gets blood from your left atrium, and so blood will back up into your left atrium. The left atrium can only hold so much blood, so that's going to back up into your pulmonary vein. Your pulmonary vein is then going to back all the way to your lungs and then to your alveoli. So you have this huge backup of fluid happening and it's going to put excess pressure in your pulmonary capillaries. So the capillaries that surround your alveoli. If you have a lot of pressure in your pulmonary capillaries, then uh, the pressure wants to be relieved somehow. So all that fluid that's under so much pressure inside your blood vessel is going to look at your alveoli be like oh that's an area of much less pressure so it's going to want to sit in your alveoli instead of inside your blood vessels because it's much less pressure to be there and since your alveoli is meant to exchange things it's a very thin wall and so the fluid that's in your blood is going to go through that wall and then sit inside your alveoli so that's how we get the actual fluid inside of our lungs uh, and that's why uh, we'll talk about treatments in a little bit but that's why we give CPAP for people with pulmonary edema which we talked about a little bit earlier as well because if the reason why the fluid's sitting in our lungs is because it has less pressure if we use CPAP which provides continual pressure we then shift it and it says oh these blood vessels is a lot nicer to sit in than these alveoli, which is under constant pressure. So it's going to then travel back into the blood vessels and be out of the lungs. That's why CPAP is very effective for pulmonary edema patients. So again, we'll talk about CHF a lot more with uh, cardiac emergencies. There's a lot more to discuss with the CHF, but that's the general principle of what causes pulmonary edema a lot. It's the backup of fluid that goes into your lungs and then causes a lot more pressure inside of your capillaries around your alveoli. So it's the fluid wants to sit in your lungs instead of in your blood vessels. This is just kind of a breakdown of everything I just said of pressure builds up in your pulmonary capillaries. Fluid then crosses the barrier and goes into your alveoli. The fluid occupying the lower airways make it difficult for oxygen to reach the blood, which then results in difficulty breathing. This is also why we will hear rails as lung sounds. These are crackles because there's actual fluid sitting in your lungs. If you hear rails as lung sounds, you should be highly, highly, highly suspicious of pulmonary edema happening. So the signs and symptoms that we're looking for, it's general difficulty breathing signs and symptoms. So you're going to have someone who has a hard time breathing, which is called dyspnea. Uh, 
breaking down the word dyspnea. Dys is difficulty and the PNEA is breathing. So difficulty breathing. Uh, when you have someone who has difficulty breathing, they might feel anxious. That's because their brain is recognizing the not getting enough oxygen, which can trigger signs of anxiety. You're going to have pale and sweaty skin, same signs of hypoperfusion that we've been talking about for a month now. You have a high heart rate because your body is trying to compensate for this, for, for the low perfusion. You also might have hypertension. You might have hypertension because uh, CHF is typically caused by long-term hypertension. We're going to cover that a lot more in cardiac emergencies, but hypertension is probably a baseline disease that the patient has, which means they are very prone to being hypertensive already. You're going to see very short rapid or sorry very shallow rapid and labored respirations it's going this person's going to look like they are struggling struggling to breathe because they are then you're going to have very low oxygen saturation because oxygen can't get through that water that's sitting in their lungs to actually have gas exchange happen so oxygen can't get to your blood you're going to have lung sounds of uh, rails or crackles. You might have wheezes that you might hear. That's in very severe cases. You might also hear wheezes, but the telltale lung sound is rails or the crackles. You also might have patients that cough up frothy looking stuff. It's usually white. So if you think of like saliva type stuff coming out of them they're going to be coughing a lot of that up and that's literal literal fluid from the lungs that they are coughing and getting out of their airway so you have the fluid that mixes up with air as they're coughing and it becomes a nice frothy substance it's usually white but sometimes it might be pink and that's usually an indication that there's bleeding somewhere in the airway mm. so our treatment for pulmonary edema these patients are very scary. They're usually very, have a, a very high level of respiratory distress and they need immediate intervention. Otherwise, they will die. So assess for and treat inadequate breathing. That's a general rule of thumb for any respiratory distress patient. If they're not breathing adequately, we need to take care of that first. Next, we're giving high concentration oxygen. So we're um, usually starting out with a non rebreather. And then our Big treatment if they have actual pulmonary edema, so they have fluid in their lungs, you're using the CPAP. CPAP, uh, like I said earlier, is uh, will provide a lot more pressure inside of the alveoli, so the fluid doesn't want to sit in the alveoli anymore because the lower area pressure is your capillary, so it wants to sit in the area of lower pressure. So we're increasing the um, pressure inside the lungs, make it undesirable for the fluid to be in. You might also see ALS providers giving nitroglycerin for pulmonary edema. That is just an ALS intervention. Uh, you guys as BLS providers cannot give it. But the thought behind it, just more informational than anything else, is if we take nitroglycerin, which is a vasodilator, as you remember from pharmacology, so we then dilate our blood vessels that will lower the blood pressure. So we are combining having the positive pressure in the airway with having a lower pressure in your blood vessels because we dilated them. So that makes it even more desirable for the fluid to want to sit inside of your blood vessels because they are dilated and lower area pressure. Again, that is more of an informational thing for in case you guys see that happening in the field, but that is not something you guys as basic EMTs are allowed to do. So keep in mind that patients can have more than one thing going on at the same time. So a person that has COPD could also have pulmonary edema and they could have both happening at the same time, which means you have to treat both at the same time. So you, if you have a person that has rails or crackles as lung sounds and wheezes, um, you could be suspicious that they're having chronic bronchitis and pulmonary edema happening at the same time. So you should be doing CPAP with albuterol to treat both at the same time. So it is somewhat, it's not too common to have 
exacerbations of both at the same time, but it very easily can happen. It's not rare to, to have that happen. So keep that in mind that you might have to be treating more than one thing at once. So moving on to pneumonia. Now, pneumonia in its broad sense, it's an infection of the lungs. It can have several different causes. Uh, it can be caused by bacteria, which is one of the more common causes. Sometimes you can have viruses cause it, or sometimes a fungus growth in your lungs can cause this. So it's no matter what causes it, it's a result of inhaling certain microbes, which then in turn will grow inside your lungs, and then it causes a lot of inflammation inside your lungs as well as a lot of mucus production. This um, causes you to cough quite a bit because you're trying to get that mucus out of you, especially the mucus that traps the bacteria or virus that's in you. And having excess coughing, and especially excess forceful coughing, will oftentimes cause a lot of pain. So uh, a lot of pneumonia patients, we're seeing them with uh, a lot of shortness of breath from having all that mucus in their lungs. They're having excess coughing, it's usually or cough that's producing something, and they're going to be having some chest pain associated with it. So, looking into the exact signs and symptoms, uh, you will have shortness of breath, like I just previously said, as well as a cough. It's usually a productive cough, and when the um, patient says that their cough is productive, ask them what their uh, mucus looks like. So, what color is the stuff that you're bringing up? Usually it's going to be uh, green or dark colored. It's not going to be clear. Healthy mucus is clear, but um, mucus that has encapsulated bacteria or virus or anything that shouldn't be in you usually turns color. So we're looking for not clear colored uh, mucus that's coming out of your body to show you that you might be having pneumonia. And like I said, you oftentimes have chest pain. The chest pain is usually reproducible. So <clears throat> one of the biggest things that will produce the chest pain is coughing. Another one is palpation. So if it's tender on palpation or increased when they cough or when they take a deep breath and they're describing as a sharp pain, it's usually going to be more of a pain caused from uh, the pleural lining. Um, so remember from earlier we talked about pleuritic chest pain. So it's usually going to be caused by this pneumonia. Once again, all chest pain is cardiac until proven otherwise, and we don't have the adequate resources to prove chest or anything not to be cardiac. So really the definitive answer is a chest x-ray, which we do not carry in the ambulance. And also we need blood work to make sure that's not something cardiac related, which we don't do in the ambulance. So even though we can highly, highly suspect that this chest pain is due to pneumonia, uh, we can't rule out the cardiac with 100% certainty. So other signs and symptoms we see with pneumonia, uh, it is it is an infection. So think about what your body does when there's an infection. One of the biggest things that you do when you get infected with something is you get a fever. So um, one of the biggest things we look for in people with pneumonia is having a mild or moderate fever. Uh, along with a fever, if you Think of symptoms that you get when you have a fever or when, you ha when you're just overall sick. Uh, you'll get a headache sometimes. You'll be very fatigued because your body is spending all of its energy fighting this uh, infection. You might get a little confused and you're going to have pale and sweaty skin. Again, think about when you're sick with any type of infection, like if you're sick with the flu. Very similar symptoms. So that's because it's the body's response to fighting whatever is infecting you. As far as our care in the, the field, we don't really do all too much for pneumonia. Uh, the biggest thing we do is give supplemental oxygen. I, again, the top thing we do is we make sure that they're breathing adequately. Most people with pneumonia will be when we see them. So the biggest thing that we can give them is oxygen. We aren't giving any albuterol for this because the bronchioles aren't constricted. It's just full of phlegm. So most of our care is supportive. One thing that you will have to keep in mind is that uh, people with pneumonia that are diagnosed with pneumonia, 
will call us back a couple hours or even a day after they've been treated at the emergency department for this because they aren't getting any better. One of the primary treatments that the ER gives you is antibiotics to fight the bacterial infection inside of your lungs. So a lot of uh, ERs will give that as a prescription and then discharge the patients, let them take it at home. So sometimes we do need to remind patients that antibiotics usually take 24, 48, 72 hours to take effect. Still, we should be transporting these patients. Don't look for that as an excuse to not transport these patients for further evaluation, but you can remind them, and that's part of your supportive care, that the medications that are prescribed for pneumonia oftentimes take a day or two to actually take effect. So just because they aren't feeling any better today when they took their first medication today, doesn't mean that the medication's not working. So moving on into pneumothorax. So breaking that word down, pneumothorax. Pneumo is air and thorax is your thoracic area. So that means air in your thorax where it shouldn't be. So air outside of your lungs, but inside of your chest vault, pretty much. So pneumothorax is caused by several different factors. The more common way a pneumothorax is caused is from a traumatic reason. Uh, so, and we'll talk about that more in trauma, but we can also have pneumothorax is caused by medical reasons. So biggest thing to keep in mind when we're talking about a pneumothorax is the chest where your lungs and heart sit, that is meant to be a nice sealed vault. Nothing is supposed to be able to get in or out of that area. And that's why our positive and negative pressure forces work to cause us to actually breathe. So that is normally a good thing, but when it comes to pneumothorax, it can be why this can turn into a life-threatening emergency very quickly. So that being said, let's move into spontaneous pneumothoraxes. So a spontaneous pneumothorax is a pneumothorax that happens with no apparent reason. So like I said, pneumothoraxes are caused by a variety of reasons. Usually it's traumatic. And a pneumothorax in general is a hole in the lung to where air can escape out of the lung. So one of the biggest causes of that is having trauma to the chest in which something pierces the lung. And so if something pierces the lung, air can get out. This becomes an issue because if we have the sealed vault, but we have an opening in our lung somewhere, every time we breathe, air is going to be escaping out that opening and that's going to sit inside of our chest vault. And if it's sitting inside of there, it can't get out anywhere because it's still sealed on the outside. So every time we breathe, more and more air is going to be getting out of our lung and sitting into the chest area, the thorax. So eventually, so much air is going to sit in there that it's going to push on the lung itself. So say we have a hole in our right side lung, you're going to put so much air that the right side lung is now um, has compression on it to where it gets smaller and smaller and smaller because of all the pressure coming in from the outside of the lung because of all the air that's sitting in there. So that becomes quite the issue because if we have too much pressure pushing against the lung, it won't be able to inflate. So all that being said, Spontaneous pneumothorax, like I said, is a um, pneumothorax that's caused without any apparent reason, just kind of appears with no rhyme or reason. The people who are more at risk for spontaneous pneumothorax are generally tall and thin people. Sometimes smokers also are included in that. And the reason behind this is if you are very tall and thin, you're going to have increased forces on your lungs to begin with uh, because your lungs are stretched out more than they are designed to be. So if you take any material and stretch it out, the material is going to be a little bit more thin. So there's going to be more forces working on it, particularly at the top of the lungs because the lungs are already stretched and then we have our diaphragm go down, which creates negative pressure, as we know. 
and that increased negative pressure at the top of the lungs or the apex of the lungs is going to cause that tissue to get really worn down. Um, once it gets worn down, it will um, form a little kind of bubble. We call that a bleb. Uh, and that bubble, which is very thin, thin tissue, over time might rupture. And once that ruptures, air will escape, causing this pneumothorax. So that's how a spontaneous pneumothorax um, can happen. And again, it's mostly in tall, thin people because of the increased uh, forces that those lungs have because they're already stretched out. That being said, it can happen to anyone. It's just more likely to for tall, thin people. So spontaneous pneumothorax, some signs that we're looking for is we're going to, a lot of patients will have the sharp fluoritic chest pain. Bigger indication that we have is decreased or absent lung sounds on the side that it's happened. And that's because the lung is not actually inflating. So if it's not inflating, we won't hear as well or at all any of the air moving in and out of the lungs because the lung is not actually inflating. So patients like this will have great lung sounds on one side, but no lung sounds are very diminished on the side that's being affected. You're going to have someone with extraordinary uh, shortness of breath. And that's because 50% of their lungs is not working. So they can only work off of one side. Uh, you're going to have low oxygen saturation because we only have 50% of our lungs working. And then you should see some tachycardia because your body's going to be compensating for that low oxygen saturation. So all these are signs of a early stage pneumothorax. Uh, and then a spontaneous pneumothorax can move into what we call a tension pneumothorax, which we'll discuss in the next slide.
So going on into specifically spontaneous pneumothorax, this is the same treatment that we really do for any type of pneumothorax. So when we revisit this in trauma, it's going to be very similar care. Uh, most of it is supportive care. We know that we need to get these patients to definitive care. So the hospital will usually put a chest tube in the patient. That's where they actually cut a hole into your chest vault. So you open up a hole into that vault and you're going to be able to put a tube in there that can suck the air out. Uh, ALS, uh, so your paramedics can do what's called a needle decompression. So that's where we stick a needle into that chest cavity and just opening it up a little pathway with that needle will allow air to escape. So if there's ALS available, go ahead and try to link up with them, but don't delay transport or care um, just because you're trying to wait for a paramedic because a hospital can do um, a chest tube, which is arguably better than what ALS can do for the patient. So as far as EMT care goes, administer oxygen. And also keep in mind that these patients are going to be in severe respiratory distress, but do not put them on CPAP. It should seem pretty self-explanatory, um, knowing all the stuff about pneumothorax, but if we have a hole in the lung, we don't want to put extra pressure into the lung because that's going to just make the hole worse and it's going to put more air through that hole and that's going to be causing even bigger problems with the pneumothorax becoming bigger. So keep that in mind that CPAP is contraindicated for anyone with pneumothorax, even though they're probably going to be having some significant respiratory distress, which is typically the patients that we would put CPAP on. So this is why we need to fully assess our patients before we intervene. And we need to know all these different pathways that can cause respiratory distress and different ways that we can assess to determine which one is which. Here's actually a pretty good animation of pneumothorax happening. I uh, showed it in class. So now moving on to pulmonary embolism. So pulmonary is lungs, then embolism. Embolism is a clot of some sort. It's an obstruction that happens in the bloodstream. So a, an embolus is some sort of foreign object is usually a clot that is going through your blood vessels. An embolus can lodge in your lungs. Um, that's where we have a pulmonary embolism. It can lodge in your brain. That will cause a stroke. It can lodge in your heart. That would cause a heart attack or myocardial infarction. Or it can also lodge in one of your veins. That's called a, a deep vein thrombosis or UVT. So uh, think of embolism as some sort of obstruction in your uh, blood vessels. So that all being said, going back to the slide, a pulmonary embolism is a blockage in the blood supply to the lungs. So we have that block that's happening in our vasculature, makes it so blood cannot get past there. Blood can't get past there and it's in the lungs, that blood cannot be oxygenated, which is a very big problem to have. If your blood can't get oxygenated, then we're going to have poor perfusion. And this is something that's very life-threatening. Um, and it's harder for us to treat because we can do a bunch of treatments to make the lungs breathe better and make the lungs open up. But this pathophysiology is different. This isn't a lung problem. This is a blood problem. It's much harder for us to fix lung or blood, blood problems. Sorry. So pulmonary embolisms are typically caused by deep vein thrombosis or DVT. So a deep vein thrombosis is a blood clot that happens somewhere in the body, usually inside of a vein. And the reason why it's caused inside of a vein is veins are much lower pressure than arteries. That's because it's further away from the heart. And veins have to move blood and they're fighting against gravity. So a lot of veins can't effectively move the blood just on their own. So in order to move the blood, they actually rely on your body's muscles that are around the veins to be contracting at some point. This is um, when the uh, vein or when the muscle contracts, it squeezes the blood in the vein and it's going to shoot it up further. So if you have someone who is not moving their extremities a lot, 
um, say they are sitting down for a very long period of time and they aren't moving their legs at all, then you can have blood in the, your veins that is not moving for a very, very long period of time. When blood doesn't move for a long period of time, it starts to coagulate. And so you can cause a blood clot. And blood clot is a deep vein thrombosis. So when we're looking at people who are at risk for a deep vein thrombosis, look for people who are at increased rate risk for having a limb being immobile for a long period of time. One of the classic signs is someone who was on a flight for a very long period of time. So if you were on a 14-hour flight um, and you didn't get up at all during that time, which most people do get up to use the bathroom, but if you sat there in your seat and you did not move for 14 hours and you didn't move your legs at all, there's no muscle contraction in your legs, you might be at risk for a DVT to develop. More commonly, we see this in people who are bedridden. Uh, so anyone who is bedridden that cannot move their legs physically or maybe their arm this is someone that we are more worried about with developing a dvt that's why people um, caring for these types of patients should come and massage these legs and muscles which will help squeeze all this blood through our veins so if you develop a dvt the problem with that is if you remember our flow of blood through the body our veins, as it returns to the heart, get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So if you have a clot in a vein and then it gets dislodged because you move again and the uh, muscle contracts and it squeezes that area so it kind of shifts the clot and it gets dislodged, it's going to start to flow towards your heart. And it should flow, flow freely because your vasculature is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So it's going to flow into your heart. And remember our pathways through the heart. This is why we had to learn all this stuff, the pathways of the heart and um, blood flow and all that, because this is where it's starting to make practical sense. So uh, the embolus gets dislodged. It goes up to your heart, goes into your right atrium, gets shot down into your right ventricle. And then from your right ventricle, remember, it goes to your lungs. So it shoots out your pulmonary artery into your lungs. And this is the first stop where things get smaller and smaller and smaller because we have to go from the heart and um, to the pulmonary artery and then get all the way down to a capillary again to actually have a gas exchange. So that clot that was the size of the vein where it first started, when everything gets smaller as it's going to the lungs, it's eventually going to hit a spot where it can't get through the artery because the artery got so small. So that's where we have the pulmonary embolism happen. So we plug up that area and now no blood flow can get through that area anymore. And again, when no blood flow can get through there, we can't oxygenate the blood and that causes a huge issue that is a true emergency that can very easily kill our patients. As far as signs and symptoms that we're going to see with a pulmonary embolism, you're going to have some sharp pleuritic chest pain. Biggest thing that we're going to see is shortness of breath and significant shortness of breath. This is shortness of breath that is hard to explain because typically we're, for shortness of breath, we're looking for a lung issue. But these people will have great lung sounds. Their lung sounds are going to be clear. They're going to be moving great air because the issue is not with the lungs. It's with the blood. So you're probably going to see patients with high levels of anxiety. That's because their body is having very low perfusion. And when you have low perfusion, you're going to start to feel very anxious about that. You're going to see very low oxygen saturation. That's because gas exchange is not happening with the blood. If gas exchange doesn't happen with the blood, our oxygen saturation is going to be pretty low. And this is oxygen saturation that's going to be not explained by any other Sym or a symptom that we're used to. Again, these patients are going to be moving great air. They're going to have great lung sounds. Uh, your skin will probably be diaphoretic and it's going to be pale or even cyanotic. That's how low of oxygen saturation you're going to see is these patients might be turning blue. 
They're going to be tachycardic because your body's going to be compensating for the poor perfusion by trying to move the blood around faster. They're going to be uh, have tachypnea, which is fast breathing, because your body's going to say, oh, we're not getting perfusion. We need to jack up our breathing rate to make more oxygen move in and out of our body. So this is these are patients that are going to be in severe distress, and they're not going to present like your typical respiratory distress patients. But their SpO2 is going to confirm that, yes, they are in significant distress as well as the other signs that we look for in the body like the cyanosis in the skin uh, and the overall presentation of the patient. So as far as our treatment in the field goes, we can't really diagnose pulmonary embolisms. You know, if you have someone that has inexplainable respiratory distress, they have some chest pain going on, and then you ask them about, say, travel, and you know they just got off of a plane yesterday um, that they were on for 18 hours, so they were sitting still for a very long period of time. Th that's going to help you in thinking this might be a pulmonary embolism, but we really can't diagnose that in the field. We don't have the tools to be able to do that. So the primary treatment that we have for this is get them to a hospital that can diagnose and treat this. We in the field, even ALS, cannot treat a pulmonary embolism. And like I said, this is a very life-threatening emergency that needs to be treated quickly. So a rapid transport to definitive care is key for treating pulmonary embolism. You can also oxygenate the patient. It's, like I said, it's not so much a lung problem, but we can try to help the lungs out with the blood that's actually getting there by having it be oxygen rich when the blood actually gets to the lungs. So oxygen will help this patient out a little bit, but not nearly as much as we normally see with respiratory distress patients. So moving on into epiglottitis. Epiglottitis we're going to talk about today. We're also going to revisit it a little bit with pediatrics because this is something that we see a lot more commonly in kids. So epiglottitis is an infection that causes swelling around and above the, epi of the epiglottis. Remember our medical terminology, ITIS at the end, it means inflammation. So this is inflammation of the epiglottis. It's pretty, pretty self-explanatory when we actually break the word down. When we have a very severe case, that swelling around the epiglottitis, or sorry, the swelling around the epiglottis, <laughs> can cause an airway obstruction because the epiglottis sits at the top of the trachea. So it's part of your airway structures. So if that gets swollen, it can cover your trachea completely and make it hard to move air in and out. Like I said, this is more of a issue that we see in kids, especially preschool age kids, but we can technically see it in adults. It's just much, much, much more common to see in As far as signs and symptoms that we're looking for, uh, you have a sore throat usually because you have the infection in your throat. You might see drooling. That's just because uh, saliva is having a harder time getting down your esophagus because you have inflammation in that area. So you're going to be having difficulty swallowing, period. You might have drooling because saliva that normally goes down your esophagus towards your stomach can't really get down there as easily, so it's going to come out of your mouth instead especially in kids. Uh, they're going to look very sick. And also the key things that we look for is they should have strider. Uh, that's because you have an upper airway obstruction with your epiglottis. So strider is an uh, indication that we have an upper airway obstruction. So that's a big thing that we will see in epiglottitis. You also will have a muffled voice. And that's because the vocal cords are located just below the epiglottis. So if the epiglottis and surrounding areas are inflamed, your voice won't be able to project nearly as well because it's going immediately after it goes to the vocal cords, it hits an obstruction, which is going to quiet your voice down. So these are some of the biggest signs that we see with epiglottitis. As far as uh, treatment of epiglottitis, one of the biggest things is to keep the patient nice and calm. Like I said, this happens a lot with our preschool age kids. These kids get very scared very easily and they get very agitated very easily. Biggest thing that we can do to help them is to keep them nice and calm. And even though it's 
an issue that's surrounding the throat, don't inspect the throat because that will usually aggravate a kid. It'll make them breathe more hard and it's going to aggravate all these symptoms. If you can give the patient oxygen, go ahead and do it. Again, we're looking at preschool age kids that won't respond well to a big mass coming out their face. So don't aggravate them to try to give them oxygen. That's the biggest key for treatment of epiglottitis is don't aggravate the patient. Keep the patient nice and calm and comfortable. So it'd be great if we can get some oxygen on them, but if not, I'd rather have them calm than have oxygen on. And then the next biggest thing is transport them to the hospital. Try to rendezvous with ALS if possible, um, and the hospital should be able to provide some definitive care and give some medication that will help out the hepatitis. So moving on into cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is relatively rare to see. Um, it is a genetic disease. So you're going to uh, get this diagnosed in childhood, usually early childhood. And cystic fibrosis, uh, it's a very life-threatening disease. Usually uh, patients who are diagnosed with this don't live into much of their adulthood. The prognosis is getting much, much, much better with recent medical advances. It used to be a death sentence if you were diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. You would not live to see adulthood. Now, there, a lot of patients are making it to adulthood, and they're making it quite a ways into life. It's still a not a great diagnosis to have. Uh, it, the prognosis is not the best. <laughs> So uh, and the reason for that is because it affects your mucus production. So mucus that's supposed to be uh, nice and thin and is supposed to do its, its job of removing uh, diseases that get into your airway, uh, that mucus is, instead of being thin, is going to be very thick and sticky. So thick and sticky mucus accumulates in the lungs and it's causes a lot of problems so that we see like with pneumonia. So these patients will have pretty constant pneumonia-like complaints because they have very thick and sticky mucus in their lungs that it's very hard to get out. And when mucus is in your lungs, it's hard to get oxygen through it. So these patients are going to have a lot of respiratory distress problems. This also affects a lot of your digestive system and mucus production in there, but it uh, typically, we it's not the life-threatening part of the disease in the digestive tract, so it's not something that we see and have to treat all too often. But the mucus production in the lungs is something that we see uh, and we have to be able to treat. So the Mayo Clinic actually puts out a wonderful video of uh, talking about cystic fibrosis and the diagnosis, the, the treatment, the prognosis. The link to it is at the bottom of the slide. If you go to just YouTube and type in Mayo Clinic Cystic Fibrosis, it should bring you right to it. Uh, I don't really do cystic fibrosis justice, just talk about it for two minutes. It's a six minute long video. In my opinion, it's definitely worth taking a pause and going and seeing. Uh, showed it in class. Um, so it, it is a very informative video that talks a lot more about cystic fibrosis from an actual pulmonologist who deals with this on a daily basis. Us in the EMS, we don't see this all too often. So it's something that you should be very aware of because when we do see it, you need to know about it. But it's not something that we see in our day-to-day -day care of patients usually. So some signs and symptoms we look at when someone's having a crisis involving cystic fibrosis. Uh, you're going to see coughing with a large amount of mucus coming up. Uh, so you're probably going to see fatigue because your body is overworked in trying to get this mucus out of you. Uh, they are going to develop pneumonia quite a bit. That's because their mucus is getting stuck in there and it's going to trap the bacteria and bacteria doesn't get out as easily. So it's going to manifest and develop into pneumonia. You might see some abdominal pain and abdominal problems. That's because of the effects it has on the digestive tract. You're going to see patients with um, some blood that's coming up when they cough. That's just because they cough so hard that they burst some blood vessels and these patients usually will be um, 
very skinny, they're going to have a lot of weight loss problems. That's just because of the digestive um, areas that cystic fibrosis affects and the increased workload that it puts on your body constantly to try to remove the mucus that is in your lungs. As far as treatment goes, um, like I said, this is a disease that affects children. A lot of times patients are dying before they reach adulthood. So most patients with cystic fibrosis will have a caregiver. It's usually the patient's parent, or it could sometimes be a, a nurse that's assigned to the patient. They're usually a wonderful resource to help you assess what the patient is like. They will also um, be a great resource for you to um, know what treatments the patient responds to the best. So don't be afraid to ask the caregiver, you know, what's, how is this compared to what they're normally like? And then how are they typically treated? Because the caregiver will almost always know what's best treatment for the patient. So don't treat outside of your scope. And, you know, don't give a medication that you're not supposed to give, especially if you don't have the indications to give it. But if they say, oh, they just need some oxygen to go to the hospital, listen to what the caregivers are telling you. Because they usually have done this dozens of times with this patient and they know what what responds with the patient the best and then overall we just give our supportive care so you administer oxygen if indicated you support ventilations if needed and then we're transporting to the hospital so viral respiratory infections usually a viral respiratory infection is minor uh, this is something that most people get. Usually people get it once or twice a year. You know, your, your basic colds, sometimes your flus, uh, anything that's viral and it's an infection that affects your respiratory system. COVID could be classified as a viral respiratory infection. So typically they are minor illnesses that cause general sickness symptoms. You know, you're going to have your sore throats, your coughs, your mild shortness of breath, nothing major though. But it can turn into something very serious, especially in the elderly and people that have underlying diseases, especially respiratory diseases. If you think about COVID, COVID is turned into a somewhat minor disease for most healthy patients. The ones that we are worried about is when the elderly or people with underlying conditions contract COVID. That's where it starts to become a much harder disease on the body. So most viral respiratory infections follow those rules. Like I said, we it's generalized sickness symptoms that we see. So we'll have a sore, scratchy throat, might have sneezy, sneezing, a runny nose, fatigue, fever. Um, the infection can get um, from your upper airway down into your lungs, causes some shortness of breath, and you might have a productive cough. And again, when you have a productive cough, you want to look to see what color the sputum that you're bringing up is. That will tell you if that sputum has been fighting an infection or not. So a lot of these patients are just mildly sick patients, but we do get calls for this quite a bit, especially with COVID. So moving on into prescribed inhalers, and we're going to kind of fly through this part because we did just do pharmacology. So if you need more review of pharmacology, go ahead and watch the pharmacology presentation. So a lot of patients are prescribed inhalers, as we know, and we can assist patients in using their own inhalers, but we should be using our medications that we carry. So we should be giving our 2.5 milligrams of albuterol in a nebulizer. Uh, a inhaler that patient has is called a metered dose inhaler or MDI for short. And that just means that it's an exact measurement of medication that comes out each spray. So one spray will give a metered amount of medication every single time. Typically inhalers um, will provide 90 micrograms per puff. So that's 90 micrograms of albuterol. Inhalers usually have albuterol in them. Some inhalers might have something else in them. Some inhalers might have a combination of albuterol and something else. 
but most are I'll, straight up albuterol. And it's written on there. It should have a trade name, but then it's written on there what medication's actually in there. So a very common trade name we see is something called Ventolin. And Ventolin is straight albuterol. So that's a very, very, very common inhaler that we see prescribed to patients. So the difference with, albu with um, our albuterol versus an inhaler is an inhaler has 90 micrograms per puff, and you're supposed to do two puffs per treatment. So that equals 180 micrograms of albuterol that a patient gets in their two puffs. Now we're supposed to take two puffs and they're supposed to wait usually several hours before their next dose. If you remember the amount of albuterol we give, that's 2.5 milligrams. So that is about 14 times the amount of albuterol that we're giving in our administration than what the patient gets in their inhaler. So that's why we want to be going to our medications because they're usually a lot more effective because there's a lot more of the medication in it. So keep that in mind. Yes, we can assist them with their own, but usually we want to go to ours if someone's having a hard time breathing because ours has a lot more to it. Uh, and usually people who have inhalers, they're prescribed that because they have some sort of respiratory disease that causes bronchoconstriction and we use albuterol because that's a bronchodilator. So these are patients that are usually diagnosed with asthma and or COPD. So if you elect to give the patient an inhaler, follow your same rights of medication administration. Make sure that the inhaler is in date. You want to shake the inhaler vigorously for about five to 10 seconds. And make sure that the patient is alert enough to follow the directions. Um, the directions for using an inhaler, you have them exhale as much as they can, and then they take a big inhale, and while they're inhaling, you push down on the inhaler, and that will deliver one spray of the inhaler. Uh, you do that twice. So you have the patient inhale that, you give them a brief second, you usually have them breathe a couple times on their own, and then you go ahead and give a second dose. If there is a spacer device with inhaler, go ahead and use that and we'll cover spacer devices in another slide or two. So right here is a spacer device. So this is the actual inhaler right here. And then this is a spacer. So the idea of a spacer is to keep the um, timing of breaths a little less critical because this will spray into the spacer, which then gives the patient a longer time to actually breathe this in. So instead of it just going straight into their mouth, it will go and be suspended into here for a quick second, and the patient has that time to be breathing in. That way, if you spray it and they aren't actively breathing, and it's going straight into their mouth if this is on, um, you're gonna lose a lot of medication to just their mouth. Um, but if you have the spacer in, you're going to save some time so it actually gets breathed into their lungs. These are just the instructions on how to uh, give an inhaler. Uh, when someone does breathe in the medication, try to have them hold their breath as long as possible so that the medication can be absorbed into the body uh, before they exhale it out. So going to nebulizers, again, this is all re review, so we're gonna kind of fly through this. Again, if you need to see this, this was done in the uh, pharmacology presentation. So nebulizing, remember it's putting medication into our actual nebulizer device and then we shoot oxygen through it uh, at a rate of six to eight liters per minute and shooting that oxygen into the nebulizer will vaporize that medication so that we can breathe it in. We do six to eight liters per minute because if you go below six it's usually not enough pressure from the oxygen to vaporize the material if we go above eight, you're usually vaporizing too much. So you're going to be burning that off and you're going to lose it to the atmosphere instead of having a patient breathe it in. So six to eight is our sweet spot. I personally usually do six. And the benefits of a nebulizer versus a inhaler is it gives a continuous flow of the medication that is taken, 
taken in with several breaths over several minutes. So you have a much greater exposure to the medication than you do with a inhaler. So that's why we want to revert to our nebulizers with our medications over a meter dose inhaler. All right, moving on to chapter review. Like I said, this was kind of a long chapter, so there's a lot to cover. So respiratory emergencies are common complaints for EMTs. It represents a huge number of calls that we go to. It is important to understand the anatomy, physiology, pathophysiology, assessment, and care for patients, patients experiencing these emergencies. Patients with respiratory complaints, which are closely related to cardiac complaints, may exhibit inadequate breathing. Rapid respirations include serious conditions, including hypoxia, cardiac and respiratory problems, and shock. Very slow and shallow respirations are often the endpoint of a serious condition and are a precursor to death. The history usually provides a significant amount of information about the patient's condition. In, determine, in addition to determining a pertinent past history and medications, determine the patient's signs and symptoms with a detailed description, including your OPQRS TI and events leading up to the episode. Important physical examination points include checking the patient's work of breathing, inspecting accessory muscle use, gathering pulse oximetry readings, assuring adequate and equal lung sounds bilaterally, examining for excess fluid in the lungs, ankles, and abdomen, and gathering vital signs. Determine if the patient's breathing is adequate, inadequate, or absent. Remember to choose the appropriate oxygenation or ventilation therapy. Several medications are available that may help correct a patient's difficulty in breathing. The biggest ones that we use are albuterol. Remember that you have to consider whether to assist a patient with their own or administer your respiratory medications. Keep, keep in mind to ask yourself, do you have the protocols and medications that may help this patient? And does this patient have the presentation and condition that might fit the protocols that allow you to administer these drugs? Remember when you're administering any medications to make sure that there are not any contraindications that are met or any major risks to using the medications in your protocols. So when a patient's respiratory rate get faster or slower when the patient becomes hypoxic, so low oxygen levels. So we should see the patient's respiratory rate go higher because your body's trying to compensate for having the low amount of oxygen, so it wants to breathe faster to bring more oxygen in. What would you expect a patient's pulse rate to do when the patient gets hypoxic? So you should see the pulse rate go higher because the body is compensating for the low oxygen. So it wants to move that blood faster to try to get more oxygen attached to that blood. And you should at this point be able to list the signs of inadequate breathing. Would you expect to assist a patient with their prescribed inhaler when they are experiencing congestive heart failure? Why or why not? So typically with Patients that have congestive heart failure, you're not going to be using an inhaler because if you remember, congestive heart failure, the reason why they're having shortness of breath is water in the lungs. So we need to put positive pressure into the lungs to get that water out. Usually using a bronchodilator is not going to help that all too much. In fact, it might actually make it worse because it will open up the airway and make it even more desirable for fluid to get from the vasculature into the airway. So at this point, you should be able to list the differences between adult and infant and child respiratory systems. That's something that we should be able to know by now. We will cover it again one more time in pediatrics, but we should be able to list those differences at this point. So a 72-year-old female complains of severe shortness of breath. Her husband notes that she's confused. You note rest, a respiratory rate of eight breaths per minute in cyanosis. Patient has a history of COPD and CHF. What are the treatment steps to assist this patient? 
So this type of patient, you're going to want to know more assessment things to it. Uh, right now, we know that her respiratory rate is 8, and if she's cyanotic, that means she's not moving enough oxygen around her body. So she is not breathing adequately. So we should go straight into positive pressure uh, ventilation. The, uh, it says that she is confused. So if she's able to follow commands but being confused, then you can do CPAP on the patient, which should help her out. But if she cannot follow commands, then you're going to be doing high flow oxygen in trying to uh, ventilate the patient with a BVM. No matter what, we want to be flowing 15 liters per minute of oxygen towards this patient. You're going to want to listen to her lung sounds. And if she has uh, wheezing going on, then we're probably going to be wanting to give albuterol to this patient. So this is a lot of deciding if she's breathing appropriately or not, and then going down the pathways of is this COPD or CHF or both. So that brings us to the end of this chapter. Like I said, this, there's a lot in this chapter, and this is really what a lot of this class is going to turn into from here on out, is talking about very specific things that we can see going wrong in patients. And it is very important for us to know the different things and how to treat them, because this is really what we do in our job. We need to be able to assess patients, find out what is going on with them, and then we can treat them with whatever medications or interventions are appropriate for them. So. Make sure that you're reading the textbook to support all the stuff that we talked about. There is some stuff in there that's not in this presentation, and that's because we expect you to know the material that's in your textbook already. So until next time.